All right, guys, welcome to another video from Matt Tutorials. So in this video, we're going to be going over the June 2023 paper. This is paper three, uh, the calculator paper foundations here from June of 2023. So I'll just give you a little bit of information about this paper. Uh, first of all, time allowed is one hour and 30 minutes. And we can see the total marks this paper is going to be 80 marks altogether. So I strongly suggest that you actually pause the video at each stage of uh, this video for each of the different questions, because by having a good go at these questions yourself before watching how I've done these problems, uh, you'll, you will get a lot more out of this particular paper. And also, if you could kindly uh, like uh, this video and subscribe to the channel, that would be absolutely amazing because it really does help out with my uh, channel. But without further ado, let's jump straight in, straight into question one. Question number one. So it says, write the number 3,107 in figures. So hopefully, guys, uh, we are happy with this first question where we can say 3,107. Question number two. Write 3 over 10 as a percentage. Well, hopefully what we can see is a percentage is actually out of 100, isn't it? So if we multiply the top and bottom by 10, we end up with 100 on the denominator, so that's going to be 30 over 100, and that in turn is going to be 30%, and we can write it out over here as well. Question three, simplify m plus m plus m plus m. So what we can see from this is that there's four lots of m altogether. So what we can do, we can just write 4m, and that takes care of question number three. Question four, Change 4,000 grams into kilograms. So what we know, hopefully we're familiar with how many grams are in one kilogram. We can see there's actually 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So that means in 4,000 grams, we're going to have four times as many kilograms. So basically this means that we're going to have four kilograms. Question number five. So we've got uh, five values. Uh, five minus, seven minus five, three, nine, and minus two. Write these numbers in order of size, start with the smallest number. So the smallest number is going to be the largest negative value, which is going to be minus five. And then we can cross off minus five, and then we can keep going along, minus two. And then we've got the next smallest value, which is three. And then that just leaves us end with seven. And then finally nine at the, at the very end, which is the largest value. And that concludes question number five. Question six. The diagram shows a shape on a centimetre grid. Find the area of the shape. So the biggest clue lies just over here, guys, where it says it's a centimetre grid. So what that basically means, that basically means that the height and the width are both going to be one centimetre, which means that each of these squares represents one centimetre squared. So if we count how many squares we've got, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 centimetres squared. Part B, find the perimeter of the shape. So what we need to do now, we need to actually work out what the total um, length is going all the way around the shape. So we can see we've got, we've got two from here. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, another two three going across at the bottom and then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So what we need to do now, we need to just add up these numbers. So that's going to be two plus four, plus two plus three plus six. And we can see that's going to be six, eight, 11 and 17. Question number seven. Here is a four-sided spinner. So we can see uh, the numbers on the spinner, we've got uh, one, one, we've got two twos and one three on the spinner. Uh, Samina spins the spinner once. Choose the word that best describes the probability that the spinner lands on two. So let's think about this. We've got two of the sides a number two, aren't they? So we can see that two out of four in total actually have the number two. And then we can see if we simplify this fraction, this actually gives us one half. And one half basically means that we've got a 50-50 chance. So we can see in this case, 
Our chances are going to be evens. Part B. Choose the word that best describes the probability that the spinner lands on a number less than 4. Well, if you notice on the spinner, all four of these values are actually less than 4. So, so 4 out of 4, the numbers are less than 4, and this simplifies to one whole. So we can be certain, no matter how many times we spin the spinner, how many uh, times it lands on whatever number, it's always going to be number less than 4. It goes on. It now says, Ralph rolls a biased dice once. So we can see uh, part C is completely separate, so we can just go straight to here. Ralph rolls a biased dice once. The probability that he gets the number 5 is 0 0.4. Work out the probability that Ralph does not get the number 5. Well, let's have a think about this. Uh, we know that all the probabilities add up to 1, don't we? So... We need to take the probability that Ralph would get a number 5 and subtract that from 1. And we can see when we subtract 0 0.4 from 1, we're going to get a value of 0 0.6. And then we can also write 0 0.6 over here. And that takes care of question number 7. Question number 8. A quadrilateral has four right angles and four sides of equal length. Write down the mathematical name of this quadrilateral. Well, let's let's think about this. Uh, we could just draw this out, couldn't we? Four sides, each got right angles in the corners, all the same length. We can see this is clearly going to be a square. Part B. The diagram shows a solid shape, and we can see we've got something which is in the form of a cuboid. Uh, because we can see we've got we've got squares at the sides and then we've got rectangles um, separating the two squares from each other. And this is actually known as a cuboid. Question number nine. So this question's altogether worth six marks. So the first proper question where there's quite a few marks up for grabs. So it says the table shows the number of books read by four people in one month. So we've got, um, I don't know how you say that first person's name, uh, Examina, I'm just going to say Examina. Uh, we've got Martha, Kezia and Tabby. Number of books are 7, 9, 1 and 5. Work out the median number of books. Okay, so how do we work out the median? This is where things start getting a little bit interesting. The first thing that we need to do, we need to write out the uh, number of books, don't we, altogether. So we can see we need to start from the lowest and we need to work our way upwards. So we've got one, five, seven, and nine. And now to work out the median, we need to pick the middle value, but we've got a bit of a problem here, haven't we, guys? Because if we choose the five, that's not fair on the seven. And if we choose the seven, that's not fair on the five. So what we do, we compromise. Uh, 5 and 7 are going to share the same median. And then what we do, we actually take the average between 5 and 7, which is going to be 5 plus 7 over 2. And that's basically uh, just going to be 6. And we can see that's true because if we put this into the calculator, we get 12, divide that by 2, we get 6. Now, part B, we want the range. So for the range, we just take the highest value, which is 9, and we take 1 away. So the range is therefore going to be 8. Now, part C, it says, on the grid, draw a bar chart to show the information in the table. So let's see. It makes sense, doesn't it, if we have each of these different people going on the bottom. And we always want to make sure the values are going up the top. So we can see the highest value for the number of books is 9, isn't it? Uh, so we can see we need to be careful of our scale. So it makes sense, doesn't it, if we label our numbers. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So the scale works out very nice there. And we want to make sure that we label um, everything up as well. So we can put at the side the number of books, and then we're spelling out to the examiner exactly what these values are supposed to represent. And then under here, we can just put uh, 
we can put the names. So we can write this down. Again, just to spell it out to the examiner, exactly what we're um, talking about. And now let's see who we've got. We've got four people, haven't we? So we've got, um, we can denote these. We can put X for Axima, M for Martha, K for Kezia, and T for Tabby. And then that just saves us time. Now, can we go three squares for each name? Let's see, we've got three, six. Not quite. So instead, what we have to do, we have to maybe split up the names like this. So we've got, let's see, we've got the names. We've got X, M, K, T. And then just to, um, just to make it, just to spell out to the examiner what these letters represent, we can just put a quick remark here. We don't have to do this, but just to stay on the safe side, in case the examiner is a total stickler, we can say refer to table. So the examiner knows what each of these letters represents. So now it's time now to construct our bar charts. We've done the worst bits, the hardest bit, just doing the scale and designing the bar chart. It's now time to actually fill in all this information. And now we can see we've completed our bar chart and we should end up with, guys, something which looks like this. Now, it's important that we use a ruler to construct our bar charts because you may get penalised if you try and draw these bars by hand. It doesn't have to be a work of art, but uh, it's important we, that we use our ruler for each of these different bars. And that takes care of question number nine. Question number ten. Four marks. So it says, Wayne begins walking at 8.30 a.m. He walks for one hour and 45 minutes. Wayne then rests for 15 minutes. He then walks for 85 minutes to a cafe. Does Wayne get to the cafe before 12 noon? You must show how you get your answer. So let's, let's work out, first of all, what the total journey time is. That's, that's a great place to start, uh, the total journey time. And we can see, let's see, we've got we've got an hour and 40 mi 45 minutes. That's for his walking. Then we've got the then we've got the 15 minutes break. And then we've got a further 85 minutes to the cafe. So what we want to try and do now, we want to try and see if we can convert this information to hours and minutes. But what we can see from this, we can see one hour and 45 plus 15 minutes. Hopefully what you notice there is that's actually just the same as two hours. But then we've got the 85 minutes as well. Well, 85 minutes is basically the same as, now there's 60 minutes in one hour, isn't it? Isn't it? So if we take uh, 60 minutes away from 85, we can see that this is actually the same as one hour. In fact, I'll keep things consistent and just put H. We've got one hour and 25 minutes if we convert from minutes into hours and minutes so two hours plus one hour gives us three hours so all together the total journey time is three hours and 25 minutes so we need to work out okay is Wayne going to make it before 12 o'clock noon so what we need to do now we need to add we can convert 830 into 24 hour format so that's going to be 08 Three zero, and then we adding three hours and twenty five minutes. Now, if we first of all have a look at three hours, three hours added on to eight thirty is going to be eleven thirty plus the twenty five minutes which is remaining, and twenty five minutes after half past eleven is going to be at eleven fifty five. So we can say therefore. Yes, Wayne arrives before noon. And any explanation along those lines would be absolutely fine. I'll just write that out again because it doesn't look very nice. And what we could do, if we wished, we can actually use this DMS button just where I'm hovering the arrow just over here. And let's see what happens if we take, um, if we wish, we could actually say, one hour, five minutes, plus zero hours, 15 minutes. So we, the calculator is our best friend, plus zero hours and 85 minutes, plus 
plus the time that we had to begin with, which was 0, 08 hours and 30 minutes. And what we can see from this is that the calculator actually automatically works everything out and converts everything into a time. And we can see uh, the calculator can do all of the heavy lifting for us if we wish. So that button is actually extremely uh, useful. Question number 11. Gabriel thinks of a number. He multiplies his number by five, and then he adds seven, and his answer is 72. What number did Gabriel think of? So what we can do, there's several methods of doing this, but we don't know what the original number is, but we do know, I suppose this number was x. First, we know that he's, he's multiplied this number by five, hasn't he? So he's multiplied by five. Then he's added seven and his answer was 72. So if we wish, guys, what we can do, we can just do the reverse, can't we? Uh, that's going in this direction. If we wish to go now in this direction, we can actually, what we can, set, what we can do here, we can actually do the opposite. So we could say 72 minus seven gives us uh, 65, and then 65 divided by five is going to give us uh, 13, okay? Or that's that's one approach, or we could even construct an equation and say, well, five times X is five X plus seven, which equals 72. And then we could rearrange this equation and we could get to X equals 13 this way as well. Uh, but hopefully what you recognize of these types of questions, if you want to go in the other direction, you have to do the opposite operation to what it's actually told us. Question number 12. Uh, this question's worth a total of four marks. It says some students take a guitar exam. The pie chart shows information about the grades the students got. So 30, 30 degrees represents fail, 75 degrees represents pass, 150 degrees for merit and 105 degrees for distinction. Write down the modal grade. Well, hopefully what you remember from averages and whatnot is that mode actually rhymes with most. And what this really means is the most common. So we are looking for the most common number of students who got something and we can see, well, which, um, which of these different outcomes has taken up the most space in our circle? And we can see that it's actually merit. Merit is the most common because it's got the highest number of degrees in our pie chart. So that means that the mode, the modal grade will be merit. Right, it goes on. It now says seven students got distinction. Work out the total number of students who took the guitar lesson. So let's see. This is where things get a little bit complicated. We know that there's 360 degrees in a full circle. And it's telling us, basically, that 107 degrees represents seven students. Okay. That's the first thing. And we want to know, don't we, how many students actually represents 360 degrees. Okay, this, this little thing in the middle is an equivalent sign because they're not literally equal to each other, but one thing represents the other, or one thing is equivalent to the other. So it's perfectly acceptable to, to give this notation, but it doesn't have, you don't have to if you don't want. Um, so let's see, this is where a lot of students get stuck. How can we work out how many students seven, uh, 360 degrees represents if we know how many students 105 represents? Well, let's just suppose, suppose we wanted to work out how many degrees we had for one student. We know going from seven to one, we just have to, we know seven divided by seven is one. So we could work out how many degrees we have for one student by taking 105 and actually dividing that by seven. And what we can see here is 15 degrees represents one student. So what we need to do now, we need to work out, well, how many 15s go into 360? And we can do that by literally just going into our calculator and working out 360 divided by 15. 
And we can see going from 15 to 360, we've had to multiply by 24. So that means one times 24 is 24 students. So that's how many students we have who actually took the Qatar exam. And then we can just write 24 over here just to be on the safe side. And that takes care of number 12. Question number 13. Verena drove from her home to a beach. Here is a travel graph for her journey. So we can see it's given some information. It's a distance time graph. Uh, and then it says Verena stopped at a cafe on her way to the beach. How many minutes did Verena stop to take? Uh, did, how many minutes did she take to drive to the cafe? Right. So the first thing we need to look at is the first part of the journey. She's driving in the car during this part, isn't she? So we need to work out what time she actually arrived at the cafe. And that's going to be at just this point over here. And we can see that's actually going to be between 12 and 1. So that will be... But it says how many minutes, doesn't it? So we can't give a time. So we have to see... So we can see that there's actually 30 minutes between 12 and 12.30. So 30 minutes. Part 2. Write down the distance from Marina's home to the cafe. Well, we can see... She's at the cafe just over here, isn't she? So... Let's see, this is the cafe. This is clearly going to be the beach just over here. And we can see that the distance from the cafe to her home is going to be 10 miles. So 10 miles we can write down over here. Let's now have a look at uh, the next part, part B. Rowena stayed at the beach for one and a half hours. She then drove home without stopping. Rowena arrived home at four o'clock on the grid, complete the travel graph. Right, so let's just take a look at this one by one. She stayed at the beach for an hour and a half. Now we can see she's arrived at the beach uh, at 1.30, hasn't she? So just over here at 1.30, she's arrived at the beach. So we've got to think about this. If she's at the beach for an hour and a half, we can see, can't we, that she's going to be at the beach until 3 o'clock which is going to be just over here. So we can draw a flat line because she's not going anywhere. So the distance remains at 35 miles from her home. And again, it's important that we use a rule for this. And then three o'clock, she's gonna depart and go back home. Now it says that she arrived home. This is the next piece of information. It says that she arrives home at 1600. So if we go back up here, we can see 1600 is just over here. So then we can just draw another line going from the point when she departs the beach, when she goes back home. And we should have a complete distance time graph that looks like this. See, so it says work out the average speed for the journey from the beach to Rowena's home. Or Rowena's home. So it says... Let's have a look at this. It says um, average speed from the beach to home. So we're interested in what the average speed is during this part of the journey. Now, the average speed actually represents the gradients, but there is another way around this. Let's have a, th let's have a think about this. It's taken... Journey time is one hour. So they've made this quite easy for us here. And... So it's taken one hour for Marina to travel 35 miles. And since it's a straight line going all the way across as well, we can see uh, this clearly, if it's taken one hour for uh, Rowena to travel 35 miles, then the average speed is clearly going to be 35 miles per hour. Question number 14, 120 boxes cost £6, 270 bags cost £10, a bag is cheaper than a box, how much cheaper? Give your answer in pence, correct to one decimal place. Right, a lot of information in this question, it's worth four marks altogether. So let's think about this. We need to work out, don't we, the cost of a box and the cost of a bag, don't we? So 
Let's see. First thing that we can do, we can say costs uh, box. Now, it wants the answer to be in pence, doesn't it? So it's best if we convert these values. Six pounds is the same as 600 pence. 10 pounds is the same as 1,000 pence. And that's going to make it easier for us uh, when we start doing comparisons. Cost per box is going to be, right, the total amount, which is 600 pence, divided by the number of boxes, which is 120. So 600 divided by 120 gives us five pence. So the cost is going to be five pence per box. Okay, that's the, that's the first thing. Now we want the costs per bag. And we can do the same sort of thing. So let's see, we've got 10,000 pence divided by the number of bags, which is going to be 270. And if we actually take 1,000, divide it by 270. Now we end up with 3.7, right? To the, to the nearest, de to, to one decimal place, this is going to be 3.7037 dot dot dot. To one decimal place, this would be 3.7 pence. And we want to work out how much cheaper is the bag compared to the box. Well, we just take the difference, don't we? So the difference is going to be five pence minus 3.7 pence. So it's going to be 1.3 pence cheaper for a bag compared to what it is for a box. Question number 15. There are only red beads and green beads in a bag. The number of red beads to the number of green beads is one to four. So if we wish, we can also write this out like this. Basically, red to green is one to four. There are 35 red beads in a bag. Work out the total number of beads in the bag. So let's think about this. We, what we can see here, we can see the one basically means that there's 35 beads. So let's see, one part of the ratio is equal to 35 beads. It gives us that bit of information, okay? But we can see that the total parts is equal to five parts. So if one part is 35 beads, five parts, so the four parts for the green, in the five parts for the uh, four parts of the green, one part for the red, we can just take five and multiply that by 35. Again, we can use the calculator to do that calculation. And five times 35 is going to be 175 beads, and that's going to give us our total. Question number 16. Uh, two marks this question. Describe fully the single transformation that maps shape A onto shape B. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to try and work out. There's four types of transformations. We've got enlargements, we have reflection, we have translation when we're shifting, and then finally we've got a rotation. We can see from this that it's going to be a rotation. So that's the, that's the first point. How is it being rotated though? We can see from A to B, it's clearly going to be anti-clockwise by 90 degrees. So we can write that out. We can say 90 degrees anti-clockwise. And then finally, what we need to do, we need to put, we need to state the point at which the rotation's about. Okay, and we can see, uh, you should be provided with some tracing paper put the tracing paper over, shade in, um, shape in, test different points, and what you'll find is uh, it's actually going to be about the origin because the origin is equal distances away from the corresponding verses of A and B. So we also have to just say rotation, anti-degrees, sorry, 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the origin, zero, zero. And that's really all we've got to state for the full two marks for question 16.
Question 17. The diagram shows the position of a town T. So we've got this point, we've got town T. And now if we zoom out a little bit so we can see what's going on, it now says town R is 55 kilometers from town T on a bearing of 0, 6, 5 degrees. Mark the position of town R of a cross. Use a scale 1 centimeter to 10 kilometers. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to, we need to first of all work out what distance we are going to establish on the plan, aren't we? So the first thing that we can do, we can, we know that 10 kilometers is one centimeter, so we need to take 55 kilometers. And then if we divide that by 10, this is actually going to be 5.5, and we can see it's actually equivalent to 5.5 centimeters. So this is the distance we need to read off with the ruler. Uh, the next thing that we need is a protractor. Okay, so the bearing is 0, 0.65 degrees, and bearings are always measured, guys, um, clockwise from true north. So what you want to do, you want to place your protractor just over here. So this is your protractor. Uh, you want to make sure this is really important. In fact, it's probably best, actually, to have your protractor so that it's like this, okay? And if you want to measure the zero degrees from the left hand side, then you've got all these lines and 65 degrees is going to be somewhere over there. So what you want to do then, you want to mark off 65 degrees. And then what you're going to have guys, you're going to have then a straight line going from the point T through your point 65 degrees like this. What we can see from this, guys, we can see clockwise, that's 65 degrees. And then what we can do, we can just mark off our points. And we're going to call this point R. And again, we want to make sure as well that um, on the ruler, this is actually measuring 5.5 centimeters. So that's really important, guys. And that's going from uh, point C just over here. And that basically takes care of 17. Question number 18. Solve four brackets 2x minus 3 equals 20. So this is a three mark question, so there's quite a lot of work involved and we can see these questions are starting to get quite a bit more difficult. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to multiply out the brackets. So imagine, guys, that you've got an invisible multiplication sign between the 4 and the 2x minus 3. Now you want to make sure when you're multiplying this out that it's all of 2x minus 3 multiplied by 4. So this implies, that's what this arrow means, 4 times 2x gives us 8x, 4 times minus 3 gives us minus 12, equals 20, and then we can add 12 to both sides of this equation, so the 8x equals 32, so we're adding 12 to 20, and then finally, dividing both sides by 8, x is going to be 32 over 8, and that's exactly the same as 32 divided by 8. And if we wish, we can then say that's equal to 4, and then we can write it down again. And really, that's all we need to do for question number 18. Question number 19. Jenny invests £3,000 for six years at a Y% percent simple interest per year. At the end of the six years, Jenny has received a total of £450 in interest. Look out the value of Y. So, what we can see from this is it, simple interest basically means, guys, that the interest stays exactly the same every single year. So that makes it very easy for us, actually. It's for six years. So, basically, let's have a look at this. The interest per year which is exactly the same, it's going to be for £450 of interest, which we've earned, divided by the number of years, which is six. So we just need to take 450 and we need to divide that value by six and we can see that £75 of interest has been made per year. 
Okay, so what we need to do now, we need to work out what this percentage actually is. And what we do, we take 75 and we divide that, we take the interest, which is 75 pounds. And we're going to divide that by 3,000 pounds. And then what we're going to do, we're going to multiply that by 100 because it's a percentage. We're working out 75 as a percentage of 3,000 because 75 pounds is the interest, 3,000 3, was the principal amount. So if we put this into the calculator, we've got 75 over 3,000 multiplied by 100 because it's a percentage. And we can see overall that's going to be 2.5%. So that's the interest rate. So since the Y actually represents the, the constant, Y is therefore going to be 2.5. And that takes care of question number 19. Question number 20, four marks altogether for this question. So we need to simplify M squared brackets to the power of three. So what we're doing here, we're using the multiplication law of indices where what we're doing, we can basically just see that this is going to be m squared and then we actually times the 2 by 3 whenever we're dealing with the brackets. 2 times 3 is 6, so that's going to be n to the power of 6. Part B, simplify x to the, x to the 5 times x to the 8. So we're using the addition law of indices here where we write x and then we've got x to the power of 8 plus 5 and this actually gives us x to the power of 13 which is what we get when we add the 5 and the 8. Part c, expand 4p brackets p squared plus 3p. So again what we can do here we can imagine that we've got an invisible multiplication sign between the 4p and the brackets and we need to expand and multiply everything inside the brackets by 4p. So we've got two things to do here. Uh, we've got 4p multiplied by p squared. And uh, now p is the same as p to the one, so that's just going to be 4p cubed. And then the second, and then we can, we can write plus over here, which comes from this plus sign here. Uh, next, what we need to do, we need to take 4p or 4p to the 1, multiply that by 3p to the 1. 4 times 3 is 12. p to the 1 times p to the 1 is p squared. So that's going to be our final answer. Altogether, that's going to be 4p cubed plus 12p squared. Question number 21. Uh, altogether, this question is worth 5 marks. So part A, it says, Johnny wants to know how much coffee he will need for 800 people at a meeting. Each person who drinks coffee will drink two cups of coffee. 10.6 grams of coffee is needed for each cup of coffee. Johnny assumes 68% of the people will drink coffee. Using this assumption, work out the amount of coffee Johnny needs. Give your answer correct to the nearest gram. So let's see, a lot of information in this question. The first thing that we can do, we can find out how many people are actually gonna be drinking coffee. 800 people are in the meeting total, 68% of people drink coffee. So we need to work out 68% of 800. And that's exactly the same, guys, as 68 out of 100, which is 68% of means that we times. So we're timesing that by 800. Uh, so we can take 68%, which is 68 over 100. We're timesing that value by 800. So we can see that 544 people drink coffee. And it now says each person who drinks coffee will drink two cups of coffee. So uh, total cups is therefore going to be 544. We're multiplying that by two because it's two cups per person. So we can see that there's going to be a total of 1,088 cups. And now, and now it gives us the final bit of information. It says that there's 10.6 grams of coffee needed for each cup of coffee. So basically this means then that the total uh, mass is going to be 1,088 cups. We multiply that by the number of grams per cup which is going to be 
so if we take the tan 088 times 10.6, we can see altogether that's going to be 11532.8 grams. Uh, we want this correct to the nearest gram. So to the nearest gram, we can see that the, that the two is going to round up to a three. So that's going to be 11,533 grams. And then just to make sure we can also write it down over here, which will be to the nearest gram. Okay, uh, it goes on. It says, Johnny's assumption is wrong. 72% of the people will drink coffee. How does this affect your answer to part A? Well, at first Johnny thought it was a 68%. Now he's saying 72. So this basically means more people will drink coffee. Uh, therefore, more cups are needed. Therefore, these two, three little dots are shorthand for therefore, because mathematicians love to be lazy. Uh, so when we can say therefore, um, our answer to part A will increase. And that takes care of question number 21. Question number 22. So this question is an angles question. Uh, five marks this question is altogether. A, C, F, and A, D, G are straight lines. B, C, D, and E, F, G are parallel lines. Show that the triangle A, C, D is a isosceles. Give a reason for each stage you're working. So let's see. If A, C, if A, C, D is indeed an isosceles, we need to prove, don't we, that two of the angles are actually going to be the same. Okay, if we can prove that two angles in an isosceles are the same, that completes the proof. So the first thing that we can do, we can work out we can easily work out what ADC a, is. And we can see that that is just going to be 180 minus 110 because uh, we can see that basically each um, straight line adds up to 180. So if we take 180 and we subtract 110, we get 70 degrees. And again, we can say because AD, G, makes up 180 degrees because it's a straight line. Uh, so we can write 70 degrees here. Now what we need to do, we need to next work out CFG next, this angle over here. So we can say that C, for the same reason CFG is also going to be 180 minus 125, that's going to give us 55 degrees. And then if you notice, ACD is also going to be equal to 55 degrees, isn't it? So we can say um, ACD equals CFG, which equals 55 degrees by Corresponding angles. Okay, and then we've got two out of the three angles. We can then work out CAD. So then we can say CAD is going to be 180 minus 70 minus 55. So again, 180 minus 70 minus 55 also gives us 55 degrees. And then we can say because angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Or we can say triangle, just to be even more pedantic, we can say triangle ACD. 
so we know exactly what we're talking about to the examiner. So we've just established then that's 55 degrees. So now we can say uh, DAC or CAD equals uh, CF G, which is 55 degrees. Therefore, triangle ACD is an isosceles. And that completes the proof for um, question number 22. Question number 23. It takes 14 hours for five identical pumps to fill a water tank. How many hours would it take for four of these pumps to fill another water tank of the same size? Right. So the first thing you want to look at this, right? Please, please, please do, do not do this, guys. Do not divide by five and times by four. Okay. It doesn't work like that. This is inverse proportion. So let's think about this. We've got five pumps all working in a perfect operation, which is the equivalent to taking 14 hours. Okay. Now let's suppose only one pump was working. Now have a think about this. Only one pump is working. Do we divide, does it, so to go from five pumps to one pump, we divide by five. Does this mean that we also divide 14 hours by five? Take a moment to pause the video as well if you have to. The answer is going to be no, we don't do this and I'll explain, I'll explain why. If all five pumps is doing its job perfectly fine and all of a sudden you're down to one pump, one pump has got to do, if you think about it, one pump is all by itself, isn't it? You, 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 you're four pumps down, but basically it's going to take you five times longer. Now, if we divide by five, that means it's taking, it's going to be five times quicker, but it's not, it's taking five times longer. So we don't multiply by five, instead we, so we don't divide by five, instead we multiply by five. So one pump is therefore going to take 70 hours, okay? And now what we can do, this is inverse proportion. So let's see what happens now with four pumps. All of a sudden, if four pumps are working, it's going to be four times quicker. So we divide by four. We do the opposite to what may seem obvious. So 70 divided by four, and we can see this brings it down to 17.5 uh, hours. Great question I always like to ask myself as well, guys. Does this value look right? Yes, it does. If you think about it, you had five pumps, you're down to four, it's going to take a little bit longer. So we've gone from 14 hours to 17 and a half hours. Sounds about right. So this is the procedure. It's all about inverse proportion. Um, so we need to do the opposite to what we would, uh, what we may think would be the best course of action. Question number 24. A and B are numbers such that A equals two squared times three to the four times seven. B equals three squared times seven squared. Find the highest common factor of A and B. Right, so the best thing to do here, this is what I would suggest. What we're gonna do, we're gonna write out A, we're gonna rewrite A, so we've got two squared times three to the four. And instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write, instead of seven, I'm gonna write seven to the one. And then B, if you noticed, if you noticed two isn't a factor of B, but what you can do, you can say two to the zero. And this is going to make more sense just in a second. Times three squared times seven squared. Now, whenever we are working out the highest common factor of A and B, what we can do now, we can, we can take two and we always choose the lowest of the powers now. We're comparing the powers and that's why we've introduced two to the zero for B. It's to make it easier to compare the powers. Uh, so we can see lowest power is zero. Then we've got the three, lowest power is two, so we select two. Onto the seven, lowest power is one. 
And now we can go into our calculator, we can just put this straight in, we've got 2 sub 0, 3 squared, times 7 to the 1. We can see that our, our highest com factor is going to be 63. Now this may, you might, you might be thinking, well, why go through all this trouble for the sake of one mark? And the reason why is because we're going to need this again for the lowest com multiple. We can now see for the lowest com multiple of A and B, what we're actually doing now, it's quite ironic really because it's, it's a lowest com multiple, but it's actually, now we're going to be choosing the highest power. So lowest com multiple is always actually greater than highest com factor. Uh, you wouldn't think you wouldn't think it when you look at the name, but actually, lowest com multiple will always be greater than equal to highest com factor. So again, we can look at this thing again that we've worked out. Uh, highest power this time, so that's going to be two to the two. Highest power for the three is four. Highest power for the seven is two. And then we can just put this also into the calculator. That's going to be two squared times three to the four times 7 squared and we can see we've got a much higher higher lowest com multiple that's actually going to be 15,876 so extremely large value and that's for two marks and that takes care of number 24. Question number 25 lava flows from a volcano at a constant rate of 11.9 meters cubed per second how many days does it take for 67,205,600 meters cubed of lava to flow from the volcano? Give your answer correct to the nearest day. Right, a lot of information here. So, first of all, we want to look at um, a few things, don't we, first of all? Uh, we can see that, first of all, the rate. We need to recall the formula for rate. Rate is actually equal to the volume over time, okay? And the clue lies in the units. We can see the volume in meters cubed is sitting at the top and then the time is sitting at the, at the bottom for the units. We are interested in the time. We know that the, we know the rate is 11.9. We know volume is this really large number and we want to know the time. So the first thing that we need to do, we need to rearrange this formula. So time is actually going to be the volume over the rate. Uh, so we're going to be taking 67,000, sorry, 67 million, 205,600 over 11.9. And we've got to be careful with this, guys, because it's going to actually be giving us the time in seconds but in the question it wants us it wants it correct to the nearest day so we've got five six four seven five two nine point four one two seconds so to the nearest day let's let's work this out we need to work out how many seconds in a day don't we well let's see 24 hours in a day 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in an hour uh, 60 seconds in a minute. So we've got 24 times 60 times 60. So we can see that there's 86,400 seconds in one day. So what we need to do, we need to then divide that by 86,400. So again, we can take our answer 5, 6, Four seven five two nine point four one two. We're dividing that by eighty six thousand four hundred, and we can see altogether that's going to give us sixty five point three six four dot dot dot. So to the nearest day, we can see this is actually going to remain rounded down because the three is less than five. So it's going to be sixty five days. Question number 26. So this question, uh, just worth the two marks. Uh, it says here's the graph of y equals x squared minus two x minus two. Write down the coordinates of the turning point on the graph of y equals x squared minus two x minus two. 
Well, the turning point basically means the vertex, which is going to be this point just over here. And we can see the coordinates of this point is going to be at 1, minus 3. Part B, write down an estimate for one of the roots, one of the roots of x squared minus 2x minus 2 equals 0. So the root, basically, we can see that's when, that's when y is going to be equal to 0. So it's when the graph intersects the x-axis. And it's the estimation that we want. So let's go with the positive solution because we like it to be positive. So uh, looking at the scale, we can see um, 0 0.2 represents 1 square. So we can see it's between... 2.6 and 2.8, so we can we can deduce that that's going to be uh, 2.7. X equals 2.7. That would be a, an appropriate estimation for number 26. Question number 27. A solid cuboid is made of metal. The metal has a density of 9 grams per cubic centimetre. The volume of the cuboid is 72 centimetres cubed. Work out the mass of the cuboid. Right, so first of all, we need to recall that with the mass density volume formula. And what we can actually see from this is the following. Mass is equal to density times volume, okay? Uh, because we can see grams per cubic centimetres times centimetres cubed is just going to go, that's just going to bring us back to... Uh, Grams. So we can we can see we want the mass, so we cover up the mass. What we're left with is density times volume. So we can start by writing the formula out. Mass equals density times the volume. Uh, we can see that the units here are consistent. Uh, so we don't need to actually make any adjustments or change anything. We've got 9 grams per cubic centimetre multiplied by 72 cubic centimetres. So we just need to take the 9 and actually multiply that by 72. Uh, and that gives us 648 grams. And then we can just write 648 out again. And that takes care of number 27. Question number 28. So final question on this examination. Uh, part 8 says, write 9 times 10 to the 4, the ratio 9 times 10 to the 4 to... 4.5 times 10 to the 6 in the form of 1 to n, where n is an integer. So what we can see from ratios, guys, is we can't add anything on both sides. We can't subtract anything on both sides. But what we can do, we can actually divide uh, or multiply both sides of the ratio, just as long as it's the same value. So how do we go from this to having 1 over here? And we do that by actually... Divide, we can do that by dividing 9 times 10 to the 4 by itself. And then whatever we do to the left-hand side, we need to do exactly the same also on the right-hand side. So the ratio becomes 1, 2, and then we've got 4.5 times 10 to the 6 over, which is exactly the same as dividing, over 9 times 10 to the 4. So we need to do this calculation. Best if we do this as a fraction. So we need to write 4.5 times 10 to the 6 out in standard form. And that's over 9 times 10 to the 4. And we can see that we actually get a value of 50. So our ratio is therefore just going to be 1 to 50. And then finally, we've got part B. Uh, now it says write the following numbers in order of size starting with the smallest number. So let's see. The biggest giveaway here for the smallest number, if you notice, minus 3 means that we... Uh, it basically means that uh, we need to shift the decimal place three units to the left. But we've still got to be careful. Now, the best thing to do is to take all of these and convert these into ordinary numbers. That's what I would suggest. So let's start with the first one. We've got... 5.625 times 10 to the 4. As an ordinary number, we can see that's going to be 56,250. Then we've got 5,625, no change there. Now, 56,250 to the power of minus 3 actually does... 
uh, give us 56.25. So this may well be the smallest number, but we still need to now uh, make the conversion with our last remaining one. We've got 0 0.005625 times 10 to the 5. And we can see we've actually got uh, 562.5. So as it turns out, this was actually the smallest value, but we could have easily, it could have easily not been had we have um, had a couple more zeros for that last uh, value. So we have to make sure that we're writing down our original value. So we can see at the number one, smallest value, that's going to be 56,250 times 10 to the minus three. So we've, uh, that's at number one. At number two, we've got uh, 526.5, which can also be wrote as 0 0.005625 times 10 to the five. At number three, we've got the ordinary number, which is very easy to write out. That's just going to be 5625. And then finally, we've got um, five, 0.625 times 10 to the power of 4, which will be the largest value out of uh, all four. And guys, that takes care of paper three of the uh, June 2023 Foundation tier program paper. Guys, uh, if you like this video, please kindly leave a like and subscribe to this channel. That would be greatly appreciated because it really does help me out with my channel. I want this channel to uh, reach out to as many people as possible. Also, guys, if you've got any questions, please feel free to leave a question in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.